Started about five minutes, so so like, you need to grab a beer, give a donation to Pikes Peak Outdoor Recreation Alliance. That'd be great, and then uh, get some chips and get anyway get get organized. Get ready. Come. Yeah, you're set. I'm <laughs> <laughs> 
We'll leave that. You ready? Okay, well, you're going to walk up. Hi, right, guys. We have a real short video to show you, real quick. I'll just tell him what I said. Okay. <laughs> Sure, sound is good for Tom. Yeah. Well, okay. All right. Can you guys hear me? <laughs> Couldn't hear that, right? <laughs> well, that was just a real quick video to introduce the Pikes Peak Outdoor Recreation Alliance, uh, and it's going again. Okay. <laughs> All right. We're going to ignore that for that for now. Um, my name is Becky Lineweber, and my husband David and I own Anglers Covey. Uh, but you probably haven't seen me around the shop a lot the last few years, and that is because I have been running the Pikes Peak Outdoor Recreation Alliance. So that is a 501c3 nonprofit here in the Pikes Peak region, and our mission is to strengthen the outdoor recreation industry um, for the Pikes Peak region through leadership and collaboration. And what we are is we're, we're kind of a big tent. We bring together all the outdoor entities. So we have a lot of outdoor businesses like Angler's Covey, outdoor nonprofits that you're probably familiar with, a lot of land managers and government entities. And we all work together to work on some of the challenges that we have here in the Pikes Peak region uh, and to solve some of those things and to come together and strengthen what we all love is our great outdoors. One of the big things we're working on right now is a planning initiative that we're doing with the state of Colorado. We've been selected as one of the regional partnerships across the state to work on conservation and recreation planning. And what we're doing is for the three counties, El Paso, Teller, and Fremont County. Um, so we'd love to have you guys involved in, in that work. We're doing some listening sessions coming up in January. Uh, we also do a lot of other things. We have different events. Uh, we have a user-based website, pikespeakoutdoors.org, to help you find your next adventure. Uh, but we're trying to lean in on all the great things that we love about the Pikes Peak region's outdoors and trying to make it better for, for all of us, uh, for the land, and for the future generations. So that's who we are, PPORA. So if you enjoy a beer tonight, that's who you're supporting. So really appreciate all of you. Thanks for coming out to this Angler's Covey event, and I hope you have a wonderful time. This is a little too low for me, guys. Sorry. Sorry, Mom. Hi, everybody. I am so glad to see so many familiar faces here. Thank you all for coming. I know we're all here for a really good reason. Mr. Tom Rosenbauer here. Who has listened to Tom's podcast here before? 
It's kind of what I thought. Me too. It's super good. So if you haven't listened to Tom's podcast, um, it is called the Orvis Fly Fishing Guide Podcast. And it is good for you if you have been fly fishing for five minutes or 15 years plus. So if you haven't, I would suggest going home tonight and listening to some of his podcasts. But we have the pleasure of listening to Tom in person, which not many people have gotten the opportunity to do since COVID. Um, and so I just want to introduce him. He's been with Orvis in Vermont for over 30 years. He's an author. 46? Okay, well, that's specific. Okay. 46 years with Orvis over in Vermont. Um, and just a really great who loves education and conservation. So if you could just give a hand for Mr. Tom Rosenbauer. Thank you, Rachel. Thank you, Rachel. And Rachel uh, was too modest to say that a couple of years ago, she was a guest on my podcast, one of the more popular uh, podcasts I've done on winter fishing. So I like to get real experts on the podcast. So as usual, we have some audiovisual problems, even though we spent an hour getting this, getting this ready earlier. Uh, so I apologize. Any questions so far? Push it. I don't know why it just took long. Tom, tell us about your tour. My tour? How's it my tour. Well, we did uh, we did two Orvis stores and three fly shops since uh, Wednesday night, and a little fishing in between. So it's been fun. It's been really fun. One big carp and a bunch of trout, <laughs> and the carp was more exciting than anything else. <laughs> Can't tell you. Top secret. Classified. Pardon me. The carp was in Denver. Yeah, the carp was in Denver. Yep. Uh, I caught it on a fly that was tied by one of the guys from Trouts, Eric. And um, they gave me the fly and they wanted me to fish it. Kind of looked like a woolly bugger. There we are. So minor glitch, not so bad. We're almost there. We've seen worse on this tour, believe me. It's a, it's a new, we got new toys, so it's like you have to figure it all out. How's that? Okay, and then I have my switcher somewhere. That one helps. Uh, school behind me. No. Yeah. Got it. Okay. And I have a laser pointer out here, but it doesn't work on these screens. So I am cool. using a recon uh, seven and a half foot three weight. <laughs> it's one of my one of my favorites anyway. It work, works pretty well for either screen. So can everybody see okay? I, I don't know where you would be in this building and not be able to see something. So we got lots of screens. And they, they're really sharp. They look nice. Um, so my presentation tonight, first of all, whatever you hear tonight, is the world according to Tom, okay? Fly fishing is very subjective. There are a lot of variables, and you can do it lots of ways. You're only getting my opinion. That's all. So don't take everything as gospel. I get skunked. People can't believe I get skunked. I get skunked all the time. You know, I have bad days just like everybody does. So, um, But I've learned a little bit over the years. I've learned a lot from guides and friends and my own fishing. And um, this is uh, about taking your trout fishing to the next level. So imagine you've taken a 101 class here, maybe a 201 class, which are the free classes um, that Orvis and Orvis dealers run. And you've gone out and done a little fishing and you've had some fun, but you're not totally comfortable out there. So, you know, you're a little bit tense. You're worried what other people are going to say when they see you fishing. You don't feel, feel like you're really polished. Um, and you want to be more comfortable. And if you're more comfortable on a stream by having a little bit more knowledge, you're going to have more fun, right? You're just going to be more relaxed. You're going you're to be doing what we, what we hope to do when we're fly fishing, which is to totally recharge our, our brains and tune everything else out. So, 
I'm going to talk tonight about taking your trout fishing to the next level. I'm going to throw a lot of stuff at you. Don't try to remember all of it. Um, pick a few things that I mentioned that resonate with you that you think, hey, I'd like to learn more about that. And then go on and, and build on that. So, you know, you're not going to absorb all this, but um, I hope it's relatively entertaining and educational. We'll see. Gets a little geeky, so I apologize. But, you know, fly fishing is geeky anyways, right? So, all right. So, so let's advance the slides there. Come on. Oh, man. This is working before, I promise. help if I put the USB deal in there. <laughs> I must have put it in and taken it out. Oh, problem, problems. All right, let's see if this works now. There we go. Okay, so this is sort of like my 12-step program. My name is Tom. I'm addicted to fly fishing. Who's going to say it? Oh, you've been there. <laughs> Okay, so anyways, it's, I, I added a couple steps because I thought of a couple other things after I finished this. So I'm going to start out with a couple like step zero and step zero plus one or something like that. Um, but, you know, when you when you go fishing for trout, and I have no idea why we are all so obsessed with trout, right? They're not the prettiest fish. They're pretty fish, but sunfish are prettier than trout. They don't fight as hard as a lot of other fish. They don't get that big. Why are we so obsessed with trout? I don't know. I've never been able to figure it out. Uh, I just accept it now. I, I just, I can't. Anybody know why we're so obsessed with trout? No, it's not because you can catch trout in some really ugly places. <laughs> Believe me, I've, I've caught them in some really stinky, ugly places. But yeah, most of the time they are in beautiful places. Okay. So that, that's part of it. But there's something else about trout. I don't know what it is, but when you go, when you go out, you're happy to catch a trout. That's the thing you want to do, right? And it's a very special moment catching your first trout, whether it's on a fly or on a worm, but doesn't matter. Your first trout is, is a very special thing. And then you want to catch a big trout, right? Everybody wants to catch a big trout because you want to put it on Instagram. Um, or you want to catch a lot of trout or you want to catch a, a different species of trout, right? You, you start to develop different different goals in your in your trout fishing um and i'm gonna hopefully help you get to those goals now this is this is step zero okay fish a lot fish as much as you can i know we we all have busy lives and we don't have a lot of time to to go fishing you got to make time to go fishing but you can make time before work you can make time on your lunch hour you can make time after work. You don't have to drive for two hours to catch trout to practice. You can go find a bass pond, a bluegill pond, a carp pond, a pike pond, or a little stream that maybe has fall fish or chubs or you know minnows in it and try to catch them on a fly. But the more of this stuff you do, the better you're going to get at it, right? It's, it's common sense. And don't wait. Don't wait till you take that big trip. Do it. Do whatever you can. Sneak on a golf course and catch some bass on a golf course pile. It adds a little excitement when you're not supposed to be there. You know, I mean, trout fish, or fish fly fishing is like is, is all of us trying to be 12 years old again. Right. So you might as well poach a little bit and, and really, really expand the experience. Anyway, fish a lot and fish in all kinds of weather. Don't just go out on nice days. Go out on lousy days. You might learn something new, and there probably won't be as many people out there on a lousy day. And, you know, we can deal with weather pretty well these days with the, the kind of clothing we have. The other thing is fish with a guide. Um, we can't all afford to go fishing with a guide all the time. But guides are such great teachers. They're, you know, most of the guides that I know tell me I'm not, I'm not really I'm not really a guide as much as I am a teacher you know I'm constantly teaching people to to mend to roll cast how to how to rig up a nymph rig that's what you get out of a guide trip and the guys today in in the United States are some of the finest teachers you will ever find they are they're a good guide is going to be a great teacher so 
if you can once a year or, or as much as you can fish with a guy, you're going to learn so much from fishing with someone who's on the water every day. A lot more than you're going to learn watching a PowerPoint, sitting down in a chair, right? Drink a beer and whatever. Pardon? Yeah, or listen to some dumb podcast. I mean, there's not even any visuals. How can people learn from a podcast? I'm still blown away by that. I don't, I don't have any idea why how people can learn from a podcast. So here's official number one. Fish to feeding trout, okay? Uh, trout aren't always feeding. We have to find the ones that are feeding. Uh, the great lefty Cray used to say, I don't know why people think fish are always hungry. I'm not always hungry. And they're not always eating. Sometimes, sometimes they're spooked. Sometimes they're just resting. Um, sometimes there's there's nothing for them to eat, and they're they're not eating actively. And sometimes they're asleep. They do they do sleep. They but when they sleep, they don't close their eyes and you know nod off. They stay in position, and it looks like they're awake, um, but they're not doing much. You, you'll see them in the in the water, and they're just kind of still sway back and forth a little bit because they always have to do that. They do that instinctively. Uh, just to hold their position in the current. And they, they like to be in current. They either like to be in current or they like to be swimming, uh, like in a lake. Don't ask me about lake fishing because I'm a terrible lake angler. This, you notice this is all about stream fishing because I, I know nothing about lake fishing, except for carp, not trout. So you want to try to see trout in the water if you can. And don't look for a fish in the water because you won't see it. You won't spot them. They're pretty well camouflaged. What you want to look for is movement. And the first thing you're going to see is that, oh, let me get my pointer here. I don't know if I can handle this and this together. Um, you'll see that tail flagging in the current. It looks just like a flag waving in the breeze. That's one of the first things you'll pick up when you see a trout, because that, that tail is always waving back and forth. The next thing you might see are the fins on the bottom of the fish. They show up pretty well. And then once you see those two things, you'll pretty much be able to figure out, yeah, that's a trout there. It's not a weed swaying in the current. Maybe I should... Can everybody see if I point at this one? It's a little bit easier for me. I'm right-handed. <laughs> I can't even I can't even reel I can't even reel a fly reel left-handed. I have to reel right-handed, even though I'm right-handed. Um, so you know, if if you're lucky enough to be able to see trout in the water, um, you'll observe what they're doing. And then uh sometimes their shadow shows up uh better than the fish itself, particularly on sunny days, because they're pretty well camouflaged, but their shadow shows up pretty dark on the bottom. So you can look for shadows too. And I'm going to show you, hopefully get this video to play uh, of some um, non-feeding trout and some feeding trout, just so you can see what it looks like. There we go. So this... This fish is not is not feeding. It's sleeping or whatever else. But that's what they do when they're not feeding. This fish could be asleep. And it could be spooked. Somebody might have scared it and it just went down on the bottom. This fish is feeding. And you can see see the fish flashing back and forth. That's a brown trout. They show up kind of orangey, orangey yellow in the water usually. And different species will actually have different colors. So you can learn to look for that color. Rainbows look kind of greenish gray. Brown trout and, and brook trout look kind of bluish green. And brown trout look kind of yellowish orange. But you watch that fish. Watch these fish feeding. That fish is moving back and forth. It's picking up stuff that's drifting down to and trout do most of their feeding drip on drifting food stuff that is brought to them in the current and you can watch this fish here a little bit closer so it's just kind of hanging out there but it's very very observant and it'll spot something and it'll dart over grab it and then come right back to his position and they find these positions in the current that allow them to hold there in the current 
uh, without burning a lot of calories, without wasting a lot of energy. And so it's a very efficient way of feeding. It's like sitting in a sushi bar where the thing goes around, you grab stuff as it comes by. You know, that's what they're doing. They're almost grazing. So um, that's what they do most of the time. Now, big trout will occasionally go out and hunt and, and hunt for uh, bait fish and crayfish and stuff like that. It's usually after dark. Uh, or on a you know on a really rainy day, and it's you it's usually only the biggest fish. Most of the fish we catch are going to be doing what's called drift feeding, and they they really don't grub on the bottom. You know everybody tells you to get your flies right on the bottom, but they don't feed right on the bottom. They feed just above the bottom. Uh, but if you're ticking bottom occasionally, then you're probably in that zone close to the bottom where they're going to be feeding unless they're feeding on the surface. Um, they don't go down on rocks and, and grab caddis flies and pick them off rocks very often because that's a lot more work. It's called epibenthic feeding. And that's a lot more work to dig down and, and try to grab something as opposed to just hanging in the current and picking at stuff that goes by. So they don't do that, that stuff quite as much. They do it occasionally. And uh, yeah, the other thing you want to do is always be observant. You want to watch the rise forms of trout. So this, I'm going to show you, show you a couple different rises. So see this fish rising? You can see the rise form starting there. And then I'm going to show you, you know, a fraction of a second later, and then the end of the rise form. So that's what you see when they're when they're feeding on the surface. Did that fish feed on the surface? No. Who said that? You did, and you're not a guide, right? Okay, you can answer questions. <laughs> yeah, that fish didn't feed on the surface. That fish ate something probably about that far below the surface, but it has momentum and it has mass, and, and the fish has stuff that sticks up above its head, and that breaks the surface, and it makes it look like a rise. And the way you can tell whether a fish is taking something on the surface or not is the fact that there are no bubbles in that rise form, no bubbles at all. Now I'm going to show you another fish. I went the wrong way. There we go. So that fish, that brown trout's got his eyes, got his eyes right on that little bug and he's about to eat it. That's a rise, right? That fish fed from the surface. We know that he stuck his nose out of the water. So we know he ate something from the surface and then watch the rest of the rise. See the bubbles? When they take something from the surface, they take in air, and then the air goes out of their gill plates as they go down, and that forms bubbles. So it tells you, you might catch that first fish on a dry fly, but it might also ignore your dry fly because it's not feeding right on top. So a little nymph, a little unweighted nymph just under the surface might be a better thing to try for that fish than a dry fly. The second fish, yeah. Fish is feeding on top on the surface. Might take something just below, but probably will take a dry. Do you have a question, Doug? Doug, did you have a question or were you just, uh, okay, that's all right. That's all right. Oh, by the way, if you have any questions, just raise your hand or yell them out, okay? Don't. I haven't said what? I have to say hi to live streaming. Hi, live streaming. Where's it being? Where's it being streamed? I'm on YouTube. Whoa, that's a first. Cool. Hi. I know you know this is copyrighted material, and you're not allowed to broadcast it on YouTube. And that, and then you can. Oops, I went back. So anyways, those are the bubbles. The other thing is to pay attention to water temperature. Um, trout are cold-blooded, and they their metabolism is regulated by the external environment, not like ours. Um, and, and they notice uh, changes in temperature just a couple degrees because, because that's what regulates them is the, is the temperature of the water. So if the water is like 40 degrees or below... And you go out on a day like this, when the water was 40 degrees on the Bitterroot in Montana, and you don't catch any fish, you don't 
have anything to be ashamed of. In fact, you have a good excuse to go home and tell everybody that you got skunked because the fish probably aren't feeding very much. And if they're feeding, they're not moving very far. They're not going to chase anything. They're not going to come more than more than a couple inches to grab something. They just don't have the energy. Their metabolism is in, in low gear. So, um, you know, take a, take a, a thermometer with you to check. Not that it's going to help you because you're out there fishing anyway, but at least it'll give you a good excuse for being skunked. That's all I can tell you. Now, if the water temperature is between 50 and 65 and you're not catching any fish, you're in trouble. <laughs> you're fishing the wrong water or you're doing the wrong thing or you got the wrong fly on because they're going to be feeding when the water temperature, unless they're, unless they've been scared by something, they're going to be feeding. And you gotta you gotta do whatever you can to try and catch them, which is most of the time, right? A lot of time they ignore us, even though we know they're feeding. Um, they ignore us. Well, I keep going backwards. You think I'd know this thing by now? And you can take a water temperature. You can use a little stream thermometer that you can buy in any fly shop, or you can um, you can use one of those infrared things that points a beam at the water and, and take the temperature that way. Either way. I think the, the stream thermometer is probably a little bit more accurate because sometimes you get a reflectivity issue with those, with those surface thermometers, um, those electronic thermometers. So just put it, put it on a piece of string or uh, just, just dip your hand in the water and take the temperature, leave it in for uh, maybe 30 seconds. Take it out and see what the water temperature is. Um, I was going to say something else. Oh, and you, know, you don't need to worry about where you take the water temperature because um, streams don't stratify. They're stratify. Streams don't stratify. There's a, there's a constant mixing. There's a constant turbulence in streams. Even in slower pools, there's still some turbulence. And the water is pretty uniform throughout the water column in a stream. So you don't have to go way down the bottom or anything. Just stick your thermometer in the water, check the water temperature. It'll help you a lot. And it'll help you in another way when the water gets too warm. We'll talk about that toward the end. Number two is don't sweat the bugs. Don't worry so much about entomology. Entomology has scared more people away from fly fishing, uh, except the blood knot. The blood knot scared more people away from fly fishing than, than entomology. Um, but entomology is not that difficult, and you don't need to know the you don't need to know the genus and the species of of the insects. Um, I don't recommend it. I don't use it. I have a minor in, in uh, aquatic entomology from my college days, and I never use it when I'm, when I'm fishing. Um, but you should know the bugs to the order level. So the order level is caddisflies, stoneflies, mayflies, and midges. Those are the most common ones that you see um, in trout streams. And you should be able to tell them apart. That, that's pretty important because these flies, these, uh, these different kinds of bugs have different behaviors. And if you know a little bit about it, you can predict what's going to happen. You can predict what fly to put on and where they're going to be and things like that. So I'm going to go um, through quickly through the basic orders of aquatic insects for you just to give you a little tip. God, I keep going the wrong direction. Those are stoneflies. Those are stonefly larvae, or we call them nymphs. Larvae is the more scientific term, but nymphs is just fine. Stonefly nymphs. And they live on the bottom of a river. Uh, they live under rocks, usually uh, cold, highly oxygenated water. They don't do well in turbid water. They don't do well in, in muddy bottoms. Uh, you know, these tumbling uh, mountain streams are where you're going to most often find stoneflies. And you can tell a stonefly from a mayfly. The screen, oh, the screen keeps going off there, Dave, in the middle. Is that, is that been doing that or is it just, did it just do it now? Okay. All right. So look at, look at another screen so you don't go crazy. Um, trout eat these in the, in the nymph stage. And the way you can tell them from mayflies is that they have gills under the thorax. So in the shoulder area where their arms are, their legs. So if you turn over a rock and you want to know if it's a stonefly or a mayfly, because there is a difference and there's going to be a difference in how they hatch. Um, that's a stonefly because it has uh, gills under the thorax. 
And then when they hatch into an adult, this is what it looks like. Um, but these things hatch differently than the other aquatic insects. They crawl to the shore and they crawl up on a rock or they crawl up on an emergent willow or something, or even a cattail along the edge of the water. And then they split their skin and then they hatch into an adult. So the, there is no real thing as a stonefly hatch because they're not hatching in the water. Now, these things are clumsy and they do get blown in the water. They get blown in the water like grasshoppers and beetles and all those other things that trout eat. But a hatch of a stonefly is not going to not going to really do you any good because they're crawling out of the water. The fish will be eating the nymphs as they move to the shallows, but they're not going to eat the adult. Now, these things do come back to the water to lay their eggs. And at that time, a, a imitation, a dry stonefly imitation might work for you. And fish are always kind of looking for them. So it's kind of a good searching pattern just to throw on to, to see a fish or, you know, maybe eat an adult stonefly. But you won't see a stonefly hatch. Okay. These are mayflies and, you know, they're all kind of, they're all kind of drab and like between size 12 and 20. I mean, not, these are a whole bunch of different species. Do we really need to know the difference between all those? I don't think so. Um, you can imitate them with, with various uh, nymphs or, you know, what we use as nymphs imitate immature mayflies, mayfly nymphs. And, here are those gills along the abdomen. So if you turn over a rock and you see gills along the abdomen, it's a mayfly, not a stonefly. So pretty straightforward. They hatch into what we call a dun, D-U-N. It's an old English term. There's a scientific term for it. Do you really want to hear it? Nah, okay. Anyways, this is actually a subadult. Um, these things hatch and those nymphs rise to the surface. They develop some gas bubbles in their skin. And they rise up to the surface. They don't swim. They, they wiggle a little bit, but they just kind of rise up through the water column. And, of course, trout love this because they're not hiding under rocks anymore, right? They're, they're rising to the surface, and the trout can grab them and eat them. And then they hit the surface, and they have trouble getting through that, that surface film, that meniscus, because it's a barrier. There's a physical barrier there. And they have to kind of bang against it. And then not only do they have to do that, but the adult has to wriggle out of that chuck and, and sprout its wings and dry its wings. So they stay on the water often a long time. And this is called a hatch. And this is the opportunity to have a lot of fun fly fishing because you know there's a trout there, you know it's feeding, and you have a really good idea of what it's feeding on. So hatches are, are great times. We all look for those. You won't see one every day. You know, often you won't see one for days sometimes or or not a heavy enough hatch that trout will respond to them. The hatch needs to be fairly, it needs to be hundreds of flies on the water really before the trout pay a lot of attention to them, but they will then come up to the surface. Now this bug, well, that's what they look like on the water. They look like little sailboats when they hatch. This bug is called a spinner. It's what we call a spinner. Again, there's a scientific term for it that I'm not gonna tell you. Um, these are the mating forms, and uh, that one I showed you before, it go, flies to the trees after it finally dries its wings. It sits there for a day, maybe two days. Then it molts a final time. This is a, a very primitive uh, life cycle. And then, it, then they come back to the water in great numbers, and they hover over, usually over riffles, and they, they bounce up and down like this in the air. It's like a mating dance. They're trying to attract each other. And you can see this a lot of times. If you look into the sun, you can see these mayflies bouncing up and down. Nothing else really behaves like that on a trout stream. Then the females fall to the water and drop their eggs into the water, and they go to the bottom and it starts over. And the males also fall to the water and die. They're, they're totally exhausted. They don't feed when they're adults at all. They don't even have any mouth parts. So they're totally, they've used all their energy. They fall to the water. The trout go nuts because... Uh, this is one of the best times to fly fish because um, trout know these things aren't going to get away. They're, dr they're drowning. They're totally spent. They can't move, and the trout just gobble them up. So it's a great, great time to go fishing. This is a gratuitous fish picture because I have showed you too many pictures of bugs. Okay. Got to keep you. Got to hold your interest. I don't see anybody falling asleep yet. 
uh, I'm going to keep watch, keep an eye on you. And I know the signs because I'm famous at Orvis for falling asleep in meetings back when I used to go to meetings. And that's another another shot of a spinner on the water that's that's died. It's dying. It's spent. And it's going to it's going to get going to get drowned and get swept away pretty soon. These are caddisflies, the second important group, um, third important group, sorry. And these are the ones that build cases on the bottom of the stream. You see them all the time. You know, sometimes they crawl along the bottom. Sometimes they just attach themselves to rocks. They make their cases from stones or pieces of vegetation. They're all different sizes and shapes. Um, and trout will eat these things because um, they do break loose, you know, they're hanging onto that rock, but occasionally they'll let go for whatever reason. Maybe, maybe a cow went in the river, maybe another angler went in the river and knocked a bunch of them around and the trout will eat them case and all. Cause they know, you know, they look for, they've, they've eaten these things before and their senses tell them that, yeah, if I grab that thing that looks like stones, um, there's something in there that's going to satisfy my hunger. They figure it out eventually. So they'll eat the larvae. Um, and we have imitations of the of caddis larvae, lots of them. More important stage, the most important stage in a caddis life cycle is called a pupa. And neither mayflies nor uh, stoneflies have a pupa stage. But it's basically, it's the emerging form. And these things form inside those cases uh, over a week or so. And then they pop to the surface, just like the mayflies, except they usually pop a little bit quicker to the surface. But they have to go through the same rigmarole. They have to they have to struggle to get their wings out, and and you know this is the stage that's really vulnerable. And if you see caddis flies hatching, this is often a go-to fly, a caddis pupa pattern, rather than an adult caddis fly. Um, it it will probably be more effective for you, even though you want. I know you want to fish a dry fly, but sometimes. Uh, you know, an unweighted nymph or even a weighted nymph will work better during a caddis hatch than a dry fly. But the fish do eat the dry flies. That's what a caddis adult looks like. They look like little moths on the water. And when they hatch, they hatch pretty quickly. Once they once they get through that surface film, they pop out of that pupa skin pretty quickly. And then they skitter a couple times and bounce and fly away pretty quickly, more quickly than mayflies. So the trout have learned you know, if an adult trout has learned that if they start chasing these adult caddis flies, um, the fly might fly away right when it's going for it. So they said, no, nah, I'm not going to bother chasing those, those things that are going to twitch around and it's too much work. I'm going to eat those pupas that are a lot easier to grab. Um, but they will take the adults and, um, you know, you'll see these on the surface of the water. You'll see them flying up to the trees. They'll kind of rise out of the water and then they'll go, usually go into the nearest tree. And they'll sit there um, and rest. Now, this is a caddis fly. What's, this is what a caddis fly looks like from underwater. Caddis fly adults are dishonest insects. Remember that. They are dishonest. Here's the reason. Unlike mayflies, they can live for up to a month or more out of the water as adults. They don't feed, but they have enough energy that they can live for a month. And what they do late afternoon, early evening is they form these migration flights. And you've been on the water and you've seen it. I can see you nodding your head. You've seen it where the air is full of caddis flies, but they're all kind of flying in one direction. It's like a procession, like traffic on I-70. Um, and they're all going in one direction with what appears to be a purpose. And they're migrating upstream. Because um, when they when they drift in the current, they move downstream, right? And in order to repopulate the upstream areas, they have to migrate. And so they'll migrate, and they might do this for weeks and weeks and weeks. And um, you can be on the water, and the air can be full of caddis flies, and you'll think, oh, boy, I'm in the middle of a caddis hatch. Well, you're not, unfortunately. You're in the middle of a migration flight, and none of those bugs are probably getting on the water. That's a problem. If you see the caddis flies on the water bouncing on the surface, yeah, that's a hatch. If you see just see them in the air, probably not. They probably hatched yesterday, day before, a week ago, three weeks ago, and they're still migrating. So just be careful when you see caddis flies. You may not, you, you could see one of these flights and not see a single trout rising because they can't get on the water. Or you might see them rising, but they're probably eating something else. 
and they, these caddis flies will eventually um, go back to the water, mate, die, lay eggs, just like the mayflies. And um, you you can tell that usually, I usually the first indication that these caddis flies are coming back and and falling on the water is you look on the edge of a drift boat or, or on your waders and you see caddis flies crawling up your waders. That means that they're on the water and they're, you know, they're, they're gone. They're spent. And trout love that too, because again, they're, they're not going to get away. They're not going to get away. So um, that's the caddis life cycle. Why do I keep going backwards? And then here we go. The infamous midge. Yes. Midges are more important in Colorado than any place I've ever been to in my life. They are super important in your trout streams here in Colorado. They, um, cats or uh, midges are very common below dams on tailwaters. And most of your rivers here are tailwaters. And um, they're very well suited for the environment that comes, water comes out of a dam. They're super abundant. They're so abundant that trout may feed on these almost exclusively just because that's what they're used to seeing. And they ignore, they ignore sometimes even the bigger, juicier flies just because it's safe. They've been eating midges all day, every day, 12 months a year, and they don't notice other stuff. A mayfly floating down might be like a piece of debris to them. They just ignore it because they're not used to eating them. Um, and they do hatch 12 months a year. They're in, they're in the water. They're active all the time. If you're winter fishing, this is your go-to fly. Um, that's what the trout are going to be eating mostly is midges. And even, you know, here in Colorado, most months of the year, midges are just super, super important. That's the larva. And they look like just a little worm. They can be in any color from purple to red to chartreuse to black to white. Um, there's, there's thousands of species of these things. And I, I expect all of you to learn each species before you go, before you go fly fishing. No, but that's what the larva looks like. And just like, whoops, just like caddis flies, midges also have a pupil stage. And this is probably the most important stage. It's kind of has a bulbous head and then just a skinny body behind it. Think zebra midge. Everybody, you probably all know what a zebra midge is, right? That's a deadly midge pupa imitation or small cast pupa, maybe. Um, but um, zebra midge or the various manifestations of a little bead and a skinny body on a tiny hook, they're imitating, mostly imitating midge pupae. And these things are almost always in the water calm. The fish are always looking for them. Um, so it, again, it's the most important stage. In their life cycle, in the life cycle, according to the trout, the world according to trout, and this is what the adults look like. Um, they look like a little mosquito, but they have little feathery antennae up front, and they don't bite. So, um, and the fish will take the adults too. Once the once the pupa hatches, um, the 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 adults are like caddis flies in that they they kind of skate across the water. In fact, they kind of, they look like they're kind of buzzing across the surface of the water. In fact, in the UK and England, they call these buzzers. They don't, they don't call them midges. They call them buzzers over there. And uh, you might've heard the term coronamid. That's a Latin word. We shouldn't be using that. <laughs> Latin's a dead language, right? So my father used to tell me. Um, midge, coronamid, buzzer, all the same thing. And they will take the adults. They will take the adults sometimes. But again, they they skitter around. And if you see a if you see a slashing rise, like a really vicious rise, um, it may be the fish are taking the adult midges because those things are moving so fast. The trout have to chase them, and so it's a surprisingly um, vicious rise for them eating such a tiny insect. So those are the those are the basic orders of insects. Not that hard, right? Just learn those. And you'll be well ahead of the game. Big trout do eat midges. If you live in Colorado, you know that. Big trout big trout will eat midges. This is a um, decent-sized brown trout from the Missouri River in Montana. And I pumped his stomach. Dave, do you sell stomach pumps? Yes. Rachel, do you sell stomach pumps? Yes. Okay, good. 
Uh, it's not really a stomach pump. It's a gullet pump. But they, um, any of you here, any of you here, not know what a, a gullet pump is or a stomach pump, throat pump? Okay, um, they look like a little turkey baster. They have a kind of a nylon tube, clear tube, and they have a bulb, a rubber bulb. And what you do is you catch a trout and you get this thing ready. You you fill it up with water. You just you just squeeze it and fill it up with water while you're playing the fish. And you get the fish in. You quickly shove the nozzle in the fish's mouth, squirt the water down in there that pushes all the stuff that's in their gullet up. And then you release the bulb and all the bugs go into the bulb. And then you can, uh, you can squeeze that bulb onto your hand and you can see what the fish has been eating. Um, or if you're squeamish, you can carry a little white bowl or bottle cap or something like that. I put it in my hand. I actually, when I'm taking photographs, my wife has these really nice white dessert dishes that we got for our wedding, and I, I and and they have they're square shape and they have round and they have edges on them so I can put water in them and they don't spill over. They just don't tell her that I steal the, her white dessert plates. Um, and is, okay, good. Let's keep it. Let, what what uh, happens in Colorado Springs stays here, right? Okay. Oh, it's on YouTube. Oh my God. <laughs> she won't be watching guaranteed. She's not watching this. Um, but this is it. This is kind of important because most of us don't kill fish anymore. Right. We don't, we don't really know what those fish are eating. We don't really know. We think we know, but you know, in the old days, we'd knock them on the head, we'd slit them open, then we'd cut their stomachs open, and we'd see what they were eating. That was that was easy. We don't do that much anymore. So how are you going to know exactly what they're eating? Now, you got to catch one first, granted, but, you know, they all make mistakes. And at least it'll give you a better idea of what, what fly to use uh, for the rest of the fish you're going to catch that day. So this is the stomach contents from that trout. And if you look at these bugs, this is only a tenth of what was in his gullet. This is just a small portion of what was in his gullet. Um, so they have to eat a lot of them, which is good for us because they have to feed more often, right, when they're eating these little things. Um, but if you notice, most of these are pupae. They don't have they don't have any wings. There's a couple winged adults in there, but most of them are the pupas. So I know, yeah, they're, the fish is going to prefer the pupa. So I'm going to, you know, find a pupa imitation that's about that size and color and stick it on my line and hopefully catch some fish. It's pretty weird pumping their stomachs, right? It's pretty strange. Don't you think? It's pretty bizarre, in fact. I mean, here we are. We're catching this trout on a little fly that's hard anyways. And then we pump their stomachs. And then we let them go. We don't even eat them. Now, is that stupid or what? It's bizarre. It's making fun, right? Yeah, you make them hungry. But the point here is that a lot of the things we do are weird as fly anglers. Don't overthink it because if you overthink it, you might quit fishing, right? It's we do some dumb stuff. And don't tell your friends what you're doing either because they'll never understand it. Believe me, they'll never understand it. Okay, but so don't pay as much attention to exactly what bug it is, um, but do pay attention to how the prey is behaving, how the insects are behaving, and how the fish are behaving. <coughs> We talked a little bit about in the beginning about um, um, looking at rise forms, and that's paying attention to the fish behavior. I'm going to take a drink of water here. And you want to you observe what the bugs are doing, too. If you have the opportunity to watch an undisturbed fish in the water feeding, do it. Put your rod down. And spend 10, 15 minutes watching that fish. You'll learn a lot more than you will watching a PowerPoint here tonight. Um, you'll learn it'll be a great education. So spend some time. If you have the opportunity in clear water, um, watch, watch a fish. Pay attention to, to what it's doing. So here's an example of being observant, observing both the prey behavior and the predator behavior. So there's a hatch of these things. PMDs, pale morning done pale evening done. They're called lots of different things, and they live in trout streams throughout the world. There's a whole bunch of species, but they're all kind of creamy, orangey, olivey colored with gray or, or 
cream wings, and they're all about a size 14 to 20, depending on the species, but they're all about the same. And they behave, they behave quite a bit the same all over the world. New Zealand, Chile, Argentina, Colorado, uh, Vermont, you know, they're, they're everywhere. It's a very common mayfly. And you're on a river and you, you see these things hatching. You see the sailboats floating down and you see trout rising. Lots of trout, big trout. So you put on your best PMD imitation, adult mayfly imitation with upright wings and tails and, and all that stuff. And you cast it out there and you don't catch anything. The fish keep rising. Occasionally one splashes at your fly, but th doesn't take it, doesn't eat it. You don't hook them. And you keep trying and trying and you say, well, I'm doing something wrong here. I know the fly's right. I, I know my fly is close enough. So what is going on here? Well, if you had been watching the trout a little more carefully, you know, you're going to do the same thing I do. I see fish rising. And I see a bug, I go right into my box and, and pick a fly and go right to him, right? If I was smarter, I'd be a little more observant and I'd look. And I'd see that all these sailboats are floating down and that none of the sailboats are getting eaten. None of those fully upright flies, fully emerged flies are getting eaten. But the fish are still rising and it looks like they're rising as something invisible. I don't know. I don't know what's going on. Um so then I think, well, maybe I'll look at the surface of the water. Maybe I'll look at how these bugs are emerging. So I get down really close to the water because you can't see you can't see much standing up above the water. You really have to bend down and, and look at it. And you put on this fly after you look at the water, right? Does that look like what I just showed you? Mm -mm. Doesn't look like it at all. However, this is what you see in the water. And this is what the trout are eating. That's the nymph shuck from the mayfly nymph right there. And that's the adult trying to get out of that skin, struggling to gotta get out of that skin. Now, does that fly make sense? It does to me. Looks close enough. It looks close enough. So the fish were, you know, they don't always do this, but sometimes the fish get really picky toward eating those emerging flies and they totally ignore the ones that are that are fully hatched because these are more vulnerable. They're easier to capture. So, um, you know, just by paying attention, by being observant, you can pick up on that. Spinners are another thing that can, that can fool you. Um, if you look at a riffle and you see those mayfly spinners hovering up and down over the riffle, you want to get down just downstream of that spot as quickly as you can particularly if they're close to the water because they're going to fall and the fish are going to eat them on the other hand if you were a half mile downstream you know in a big pool and the and the spinners were falling half mile upstream in the riffle um, and all of a sudden the trout start rising like crazy and you don't see anything on the water you're going to be totally mystified unless again and you look at the water and see what's on the water because you can't see these spent spinners very well. The, the wings aren't sticking up. Nothing's sticking up. They're in the surface film, and they're really tough to see. So just knowing that there was a spinner fall upstream or getting down and, and looking at the water um, will help you. Now, you can also carry a little goldfish net, you know, a little, little net, and you can stick that in the water and hold it there for a couple minutes. And um, do you sell goldfish nets here, Rachel? You do? Ah, in the bait shop. So you can use you can use one of those. Go to the bait shop and get a. Sorry, there's no ten percent off on on goldfish nets tonight. Um, so you can go. You can you can do that, or you can just you know you can just look down. You can't put your hand in the water and grab them because they're all gonna they're all gonna just wash around your hand. It's really difficult to grab them that way. So carrying a little net sometimes will help. The other thing you can do is you can buy one of these paint strainer screens, elastic paint strainer screens. And stretch it over your net, stretch it over your fishing net. Go to a hardware store and get a paint strainer screen. Stretch it over your fishing net, stick your fishing net in the water. It'll do the same thing. Your hat works great until it gets all wet. Yeah, but no, the hat, 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 your hat doesn't work that well unless it's a mesh hat because the water will, the water will, the water will push around the outside and it won't, it won't catch anything. Okay, yeah, it has to be a pretty open mesh. That'd be pretty open mesh. I'd I'd go with the paint strainer. 
So talk a little bit about fly selection during these, during these hatches and observing things. And let me tell you first that there is no magic fly, even during a hatch. There's no, there is no go-to fly that's better than others. There might be some that are a little bit better than others, but really not. Um, so there's a whole bunch of flies here that they all, they all imitate some stage of that PMD mayfly that we saw at the beginning, a cream colored thing. And any of those are going to work during a hatch probably because most of the time the fish, the fish aren't going to be that picky as the example I gave you before. They will sometimes, most of the time not going to be that picky. So they'll eat an adult off the surface. They'll eat a partially emerged one. They'll eat one that they'll eat one that got knocked over and you know, they don't all, they don't all successfully hatch. Sometimes they get crippled, they get bunged up, they fall over. And the trout are seeing all these different things. They're all in the same ballpark, though. They're all about a size 16, and they're all kind of creamy, orangey colored. So you want to you want to be there. But any of these flies would work. Let's say let's say we have a half a dozen people in a pool, and there's a patch of these mayflies, and everybody's catching fish. Everybody's got a different fly on. Everybody's got a different one. Everybody's catching fish, having a good time. However, there's a woman at the head of the pool, and she is just railing on them. She's catching three fish to every one that the other people in the pool are catching. So after the hatch, everybody's happy. They go to the bar, and they happen to be in the same bar, and everybody goes over to that woman. What do they ask her? What fly are you using? Yeah, absolutely. It doesn't matter. That woman happened to be in a really good spot. She happened to be in the right current. She, her casting was really good and accurate. And she used a long leader and she wasn't getting drag. And that's why she caught all those fish, not the fly pattern. 90% of the time, it's, it's not the exact fly pattern that matters. Again, you got to be in the ballpark, but um, you don't have to be that close. And use the right approach to the fish. One of the best things that you can do when you go fishing is not to jump right in the water. <clears throat> I know you're all, all anxious to get in the water and start catching fish or just get it, get in there and wait around and have a good time. But you will, you will benefit from sitting on the bank for a few minutes, five minutes, 10 minutes, um, just looking, leaning against a tree, sitting on a rock. Um, you know, don't launch your drift boat or your raft right away. You, there may be a really nice fish rising right where you're going to step in the water, and it didn't happen to be rising at that moment. So, you know, look around, see if there's any fish rising, see if there's any insects, see if there's any insects in, in the bushes or on the water, just so you have a, a, some kind of idea of what, what fly to use. So don't just jump in when you approach a, a trout stream. Take a little time to observe before you get in the water. And don't get in the water where other people are fishing. Please don't do it. It's not, it's not cool. It's rude. It's arrogant. And um, give other people their space, okay? There's a pragmatic reason that I'm going to get to in a minute. But don't tell me that the rivers are too crowded in Colorado and you can't find a place to fish unless you fish near someone else because it just ain't true. Yeah, if you want to fish Deckers, right next to the parking lot on a Saturday morning, yes, it's going to be full of people. But if you walk or you find a different stream or you take a map and you look for another place, you're going to be able to find places in Colorado where you can fish all by yourself. Now, the pragmatic reason is that all these people are spooking those trout. They've been wading up and down the river. They've been casting their fly lines over the fish. The fish are probably terrified, and half of them aren't even feeding anymore. They're done. They're gone. They're hiding. And by going somewhere where nobody else is or somebody hasn't been for a couple hours, you're going to have undisturbed fish, you know? You're going to have lots better targets. You're going to have lots more potential if you don't go where somebody else has been fishing. These are shy, cautious creatures. So that's the pragmatic reason for not crowding other people. Even on the Missouri River in Montana, um, you can find a place where you don't see anybody. And the Missouri is one of the most crowded rivers in North America. Um, on 4th of July, 9.30 in the morning, at the Craig boat ramp, there'd be 150 drift boats trying to get in the water at the same time. And that's a flotilla and it's not fun. It's not fun. And, and the fish are going to be, a lot of fish are going to be disturbed. Um, but you can work around that. 
if you're a waiting angler, you get in the water upstream of the boat ramp and walk a little bit. They're not going to row upstream. They're going to go downstream. And you can have the water all to yourself. Or go down to where they're going to take out at the end of the day and fish there in the morning and then come back here where they just launched and there's going to be nobody around because they're all gone. They're all, you know, they pulled out of the water and they're all going to dinner. Um, so you can work around that. And if you have your own raft or drift boat, leave at seven in the morning or 11 in the morning instead of nine o'clock when everybody else does. Um, ask your guy, if you're fishing with a guy, say, can, can we start at 11 instead of nine and, you know, fish a little bit later? I don't care if I miss my 430 cocktails. Um, was there a question? Oh, <laughs> you can drink anytime. You can't fish. You can't fish. You can you can eat anytime. That's my philosophy. You can eat anytime. You can't fish anytime. So why bother eating and drinking except for water when you're fishing? Those of you who fish with me know that. <laughs> Um, and then part of your approach is um, is not letting the fish see you or not letting them notice much. Fish are disturbed mostly by movement. They're disturbed by your, your rod hand in the air. They're disturbed by you walking up and down the bank. Um, you know, pr their predators come from above. Eagles, ospreys, herons, all that stuff. And, um, you know, motion above the water that wasn't there before is, is a signal that, hey, danger's coming. I'm going to hide. I'm going to hide. I'm not going to eat because when I eat, I'm vulnerable. So, you know, use, use, you don't have to, you don't have to wear a ghillie suit or camo or anything like that to sneak up on them. Just, you know, dress in kind of muted tones, nothing really bright, nothing white. You don't want a white shirt um, unless there's a lot of white clouds in the sky and then you blend it with the sky and try to break your background, try to get up against a rock or a tree or something. You know, good, good thing to do is to stand in the shade and then fish out into the sunlight, that will really, really help uh, conceal your presence. The other thing is uh, learn to cast on the side. I'm going to show you something in a minute. I'm going to show you that fish is a window, what they see in the outside world in a second. But um, we all learn to cast straight overhead, right? Like this, back, forth, back, forth, back, forth. Um, you can take that same cast and turn it on its side. That way, your fly line is lower to the water. It's not waving through the air and the fish can't see below a certain angle when they're in the water. And if you keep that line underneath that angle, I don't know what it is. I don't know what the angle, don't ask me what the angle is because it changes all the time. And if you're really super interested, you can Google Snell's law and get into the geeky part of it. But uh, it's due to the refraction properties of water. So cast on the side. So this is what a trout's window looks like, and it's circular. This is only half of it looking in one direction. There's an angler. This trout is about two feet deep in the water. The angler's about 30 feet away. And you know, once that angler starts waving that fly rod back and forth, it's a good chance the fish can see you, right? Good chance. Um, so there's a couple things that can happen. One is the fish can come up toward the surface and slide into shallow water and start feeding shallower. If I'm in a river and I see fish feeding in deep water and shallow water, I'm going for the shallow fish every time because they can see less when they're higher in the water column. That window gets even smaller and I can get closer to the fish. I can make a more accurate cast and I can see everything that's going on. I can see my fly. So I'm going to go for the shallow fish every time. The fish in the deep water can see a lot more, and they can see you better. So here's what happens when, when the fish gets close to the surface. The angler is standing in the same position there, but you can see that, you know, and especially if the angler had something other than a white shirt on, um, that fish wouldn't notice as much. Fish wouldn't notice as much. Now, the other thing that you can do is you can crouch down. You can lower your profile. Um, you can even, you know, in a really tricky situation where you're worried about scaring the fish, maybe it's a small stream, the water's low and clear, you can actually get down on your hands and knees and fish. Um, there's a great pair of Orvis Pro waders that have knee pads on them 
nice neoprene knee pads. So if you spend a lot of time uh, kneeling down on, on trout streams, uh, they makes it a lot more comfortable. But um, so you can kneel down. And we usually approach trout from downstream if we want to avoid scaring them because they have a blind spot behind them, right? They, their eyes are situated a little bit further on the sides of their heads, but they can't see um, totally behind them. Like if I'm standing here and you try to sneak up directly behind me, you can do that as long as you don't make any noise and you can sneak right up to me, right? The problem is that's only in the diagrams that they show you in books. Um, because when a trout's feeding, what's it doing? It's doing this, it's doing this. And now if you try to sneak up on me, uh, -uh cause I'm, when I turn my head, I'm going to see you in my peripheral vision, right? I'm going to notice that movement. Um, so, and, and the trout's the same way. So they don't really, in all, for all practical purposes, they don't have a blind spot behind them. Yes. They notice things behind them less because it's mostly peripheral vision that they're using. So you can get closer to them by sneaking up behind them, but don't, don't feel like you're invisible. You still have to be careful. And trout don't hear noises underwater um, very easily. Um, you might have uh, metal studs on the bottoms of your wading boots, or you might use a wading staff, which makes a lot of noise on the bottom. They can't hear sounds from more than four or five feet away. And often they're in a riffle too, which adds a lot of background noise. Yes, sir. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I did it. Because they got conditioned to seeing those cows. But, you know, they did. They got conditioned to the cows. But, you know, a human is different profile. And they, they learned to recognize that. So, yeah, and I had to... I had to move, I had to move like this, you know, and I watched. I didn't have to go to the barn at milking time, though. <laughs> no, but they can't hear very well underwater. So you can tap your waiting staff. You can yell and scream and do all you want, yell to your fishing buddy. You can scrape your, your studs on the bottom of the river, and they're not going to hear it. They're not going to hear it unless you're super, super close to them. So you don't need to worry as much about noise. How about splashing? Splashing, yes. Splashing, yes. Because what they do notice that's a great question. What they do notice is when the surface of the water starts moving differently than it has been for the past, you know, for all their life. And they know that there, there's an otter there, there's a mink, there's a heron trying to sneak up on them. So, yeah, when you're waiting in, in, in still water, you know, calm pools and stuff, not so much in riffles. But when you're in a still pool, you want to be careful not to push waves ahead of you because they do notice that. It will scare them. Absolutely. Yeah. Great question. And this relates to that. So a fly line landing on the water. This is a three weight line with a from underwater with a really delicate cast. And this is what it looks like when it lands on the water. It pushes waves. It pushes waves sideways. So the point here is try to keep that fly line as far away from a feeding fish or a place where you think they're fish as you can. Now, again, in a, it's not so important in a riffle because the surface is already broken, but in a still pool, you got to be really careful. The answer here is to use a longer leader because a leader butt lands with a tenth of the disturbance as even a, a delicate fly line because the mass is so much less and the air resistance is higher. And so uh, use, I always use... I start with a 12 foot leader usually when I'm fishing, except in really tiny streams. Most of you, what, fish nine footers, right? Nine foot leaders. Okay, go ahead. I'm going to fish 12. <laughs> um, you can buy 12 foot leaders. Sometimes I want to go even longer. And it's, an, it's easy to get a longer leader. You don't have to buy a new leader. Really? I shouldn't say that, should I, Dave or Rachel? I shouldn't say you don't have to buy a new leader. You should buy a 12 foot leader. But if you want to go longer, I don't know, longer than 12 feet, you can't buy like 13, 14, 15 foot liters. So along with the tippet spools that I carry in my, in my fishing pack, you know, 4X, 5X, 6X, 7X, 8X, if you're in Colorado, right? Anybody use 8X? Yeah. I fished, I was fishing with a guide in, in Colorado many years ago and we we're on the South Platte and the fish were really picky, really, really picky. And I said, Monroe, you think I should go to 8X? And he said, 
Why don't you just throw your whole fly box in the water? <laughs> so, yeah, 7X anyways. But um, I carry butt material. So when you buy a liter, the package will tell you what diameter the butt is. And then you buy a spool of the heavy stuff to match the butt. And you can just cut the loop off your liter, tie a three-turn blood knot, I'm sorry to say. It's easy, though. Blood knot in in 25 thousandths or 23 thousandths of an inch is very easy to tie and you only need three turns so it's not that bad take just take take about this much off that spool put a perfection loop on the end of it you're good to go now you got a longer leader and it doesn't affect the casting characteristics of your leader much it's the the middle part of your leader and the tippet the end the very far end are much more important than than the butt section so you can make a longer butt section without affecting um, your leader very much. And tune up your casting. I harp on this all the time. And I'm not going to harp on it too much, but if you cannot put the fly where you want to at 30 feet, you are not going to have fun on the water, period. End of story. You're going to struggle and it's not going to be fun. Um, we practice all other kinds of sports, but we don't feel like we have to practice fly casting. Well, you do. None of you in this room is a good enough fly caster. I am not a good enough fly caster. I take lessons. Luckily, Pete Kutzer, the casting guru, is one of my fishing buddies. So I'm luckier than you. There, are, But there are lots of great videos on YouTube. And, you know, you could take a casting lesson from someone in a fly shop. Guides will often help you with your casting. You've got to practice at home. Before you go fishing, don't ruin that fishing trip you've been looking forward to because you can't get the fly out there. You guys don't know what guides talk about <laughs> when you leave the boat, but I do because I know a lot of guides. I have a lot of guides or friends, and you will frustrate not only yourself, but you'll frustrate a guide if you can't get the fly out beyond the end of your rod. Um, you're not going to have a good time and neither is the guide. So you know, do yourself and, and the guide a favor, practice your casting. I've got a casting pond out here. You know, you can cast on your lawn. Just don't cast on asphalt because it will hurt your fly. But you can cast on grass, cast on water. Just go and spend five minutes a day tuning it up. And if you have problems, go look up a uh, YouTube video and, and um, try to correct the problems. But you do need to, you do need to practice your casting. All of us do. You're not going to have any fun. You can't put the fly where you want it. How many, uh, now, um, no shame. How many of you here do not know how to do the reach cast? Raise your hand. Never heard of it. Okay, good. If you're trout fishing, you're not in the game if you don't know the reach cast. You are not in the game, okay? It's basically... At the end of your power stroke, you just reach the rod one way or the other. This is this is also called a, an aerial mend. And what it is is putting a mend in your line and putting a curve in your line before the line hits the water. You know, mending line, picking it up and moving it for one reason or another disturbs the water, moves your fly often. Um, if you can position that fly using the reach cast, and it's not that hard, but you should know how to do it, both left and right should know how to do the reach cast. It'll really help your fishing. That's all I'm going to talk about the reach cast. I can't tell you how to do it here. Learn to read the water. You know, fish aren't everywhere in the stream. They're probably occupying about 10% of the, of the uh, surface area of the stream. And so you need to narrow it down. If the fish aren't rising, you need to narrow it down and figure out where the fish are feeding. And don't go where everybody else is. That's not the way to find fish. <laughs> Uh, learn to learn to uh, tell how um, obstructions that are under the surface manifest themselves on the surface. So here's a rock, and there's a bump that it's formed, and then a little turbulence behind there. But the bump is quite a bit ways below the rock, and there are, I mean, there. If you just spend some, you don't need to learn hydraulics because it's a very complex science, and I don't really, I've tried to learn it, but I don't understand it that well. Neither do a lot of the scientists that study hydraulics. They don't even know why turbulence forms. Really, they don't really know. We know it happens, but we don't really know why. Um, but it's really important to be able to figure out what is going on under 
the surface or above the surface. So this is a good example of why you want to know where a rock is. And this rock could be submerged or it could be, you know, sticking out of the water like this. But trout don't like to live right behind a rock. And you hear, you hear this all the time. Oh, you want to fish behind the rocks because that breaks the current and the fish has a safe place to live, right? Then they don't live right behind rocks. They ne almost never live right behind rocks. They live a considerable distance below that rock because the current is still slowed here. But what happens is all this stuff, I'm going to advance this for a minute, looks like this underwater. The current's going all different directions. It's swirling around. There's lots of cells of turbulence there. And this pushes the trout around. They can't hold their position. They can't really stay in place. And they can't see their food because of all the bubbles and stuff. And it's really, it's really a terrible place for a trout to live. So they prefer to be down here or, they, or they're often along the sides of rocks or uh, the biggest trout is very often in front of a rock, not behind it. So, you know, you got to make your first cast count and every cast subsequent to that, more chance of scaring a trout, right? So, you know, make your first cast in the right place, in front of the rock, or maybe way down here below the rock, or maybe to the sides, but not behind there. There probably won't be a trout behind there. And a uh, good question that's been asked in a couple of the other seminars is, well, if I want to get to this fish that I think is there, I don't see it, but I, I think there's a fish there. It's a good place for a fish to live. Should I put my fly here so that it drifts down to the fish? And the answer is no. The reason is that when your fly hits, whether it's a dry fly or a nymph, it gets swirled all, the, all around and drags, and you don't know where that fly is going. It can go into some weird places. So what you want to do is place your fly along the edge of the rock, and it'll get drawn down into that spot to the fish there. So be very careful. And I've, I've consciously been fishing behind rocks for the past two years, right behind rocks. And I don't think I've caught a trout in an area right behind a rock. And I've consciously done it just to see if my theory is right. And it seems to be right empirically. It seems to, seems to work out. And uh, guides will tell you that too. You know, I was, uh, I was um, fishing with a guide on the Henry's Fork a couple of years ago. And we were fishing up some pocket water, really fast water with lots of rocks. And the raft was going down very fast. And you had to make a quick cast to each place you couldn't you know you didn't have time to do anything else you had to make one cast and then move on to the next one and he said do not put your fly behind the rocks put it in front of the rock every time in front of the rock in front of the rock in front of the rock so tails of pools are really good places that, that where the pool ends and it starts to get fast again the water shallows up the food kind of gets funneled into an area both vertically and horizontally and if you're um if you're in a hatch situation uh, the biggest trout will often move way down into the shallow water and the tail of the pool so it's a good place to it's a good place to pay attention to particularly when there's insects hatching and then the concept of seams oh i didn't give you the i didn't give you the three most important things did i did i tell you about the three most important things when reading the water no i didn't okay i'm going to tell you now these are some, these may be the most important things you learn tonight. Trout prefer to feed in water that is two to four feet deep, moving between one and two feet per second, and no big cells of turbulence. So kind of a gentle, gentle chop or gentle riffle or smooth water, but they don't like those big cells of turbulence. If you remember those three things, you will be able to find trout in nearly any stream from little tiny streams to giant rivers. Okay. How do you know what one to two feet per second is? Well, throw a stick in the water and, and, you know, estimate how far it travels and then time it and see, you'll figure it out pretty quickly. And the concept of seams, uh, you've heard about seams, right? You want to fish the seams, the, ju the junction between fast and slow water. The fast water, this is going like six feet per second down the middle here. And it's carrying a lot of food, but the trout can't handle that. It's too fast for them. They, they burn too many calories hanging out there. So they slide over to the side into the junction between fast and slow water. 
and they dart out into the fast water and then dart back in. So the, the food's come. And there's a lot of food coming down these edges, too. So they'll slide into these areas to feed. Now, when you scare them, yeah, they might go on the bottom in that fast water. There's maybe some big rocks down there, and they can hide amongst those big rocks. But when they're, when they're really feeding, they're going to come out to those edges. And on a, a bend in a river, if you have really fast water on the bend, the fish are going to be more likely to be on the inside of the bend, on the inside of that, than on the outside. Um, the, 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 uh, the depth and the velocity are better often on the inside, on a fast bend where the water goes quickly around the bend. My wife is standing in the wrong place, but that's because I wanted to take a picture with her standing there. Um, I would be... You know, if I'm gonna, if I was gonna fish this this uh, bend in the river, I would start down here by this fly box, and I would cast up into here first. Then, if I don't get anything there, yeah, then I might walk up here and throw to the far bank. But this is gonna be the money spot on the inside, on the inside of it. On a slow bend, on the other hand, in a, in a meadow stream, uh, really slow water. Uh, this is probably running at one feet per second, one foot per second on the outside. This water on the inside is probably almost stagnant. So there's no food drifting down there. They're going to position themselves more on the outside of the bend here. That's a little bit deeper there, too. Uh, sometimes if you have wind, and you're especially if you're dry fly fishing, fish don't like uh, water that's riffled by the wind, and they'll move into calmer areas often. Um, so look for a place in the lead. It's going to be easier to cast to, and you're probably going to be able to find more fish. Look for changes in color. Trout also like to be um, not only a junction between fast and slow water, but between shallow and deep water. They like edges. So anytime the water changes color is a good place to look for trout. Shallow, the junction between shallow and deep. Okay. So that's it for reading the water. Remember those three things, right? Everybody remember? There'll be a quiz at the end. You don't get that 10% unless you pass the quiz. Okay. Um, be a generalist in your fly selection. So, so if you're gonna be if you're gonna be fishing a lot of places, don't try to stock up with every every fly in the uh, in the case over there because you'll drive yourself nuts, right? Um, even though even though Rachel would be very happy if you bought a dozen of every fly in the case, um, you, you're going to have to carry like 50 fly boxes with you and you're going to go nuts. You're not, you never know. Yeah. You never know. You're not going to know which fly to pick. So you got to narrow it down um, and narrow, narrow it down by being a generalist, pick the flies that are super popular, pick, pick a parachute atoms. Okay. This is the most popular dry fly in the world. I know. Cause I get to look at the numbers. Um, and it works. It works almost all the time. It, it works um, embarrassingly well when we think we, we're smart and we try to match the hatch or put the right fly on. Parachute Adams almost always works, really does. Um, and it's a reason it's so popular because uh, people have been fishing it for uh, 75, 80 years and it's worked. It's worked. So those popular flies are popular for a reason. Um, and you can modify the flies that you have in your box too. You can make them, make them different. So let's say you got a fish feeding on, um, caddis flies that are spent in the surface film. And that's what that fish is doing there. And if you had the right fly, if you had a fly box full of different kinds of flies, you would probably fish something like this or something like this. They're kind of soft and they sit right in the surface film and they don't really float up high. Um, but let's say all you got in your fly box is elk hair caddis and they float really high. You know, they got a lot of hackle and a lot of hair and they float really high and fish might not take that because it's not what they're eating. They're eating stuff that's down on the surface film. So you can give your fly a haircut. You know, I like to carry a pair of scissors, you know, scissors on a Swiss army knife work fine. Just a little pair of scissors, your snips that you used to cut, um, fishing line don't work very well, but a good pair of scissors. And what well, this is the same fly is this they're both exactly the same fly but i cut all the hackle off i cut the head back and i cut most of the hairs off it so now that elk hair caddis is going to sit nice and low in the surface film it's not going to ride way up high so you can you can trim your flies or if you think your streamer is too big just chop off part of the tail doesn't look very good but it'll probably still work so it's a good idea to carry a pair of scissors 
And then the print sniv, you know, it, it just, for subsurface flies, it just works. It just works nearly anywhere. Maybe not on the South Platte, but it probably even works on the South Platte occasionally. It's a little big for the South Platte, but, um, you know, most trout streams in the world, you hire a guide, the first thing, if you're nymph fishing, the first thing they're going to put on is a beadhead prints probably because it just works. And it's been around for a long time. And don't get... Don't get so um, you you're gonna if you do a lot of reading or or watch videos on the internet you'll see these giant articulated streamers that are this long you know um, I have a friend Sean Combs the Orvis rod designer I fish with a lot his his some of his trout streamers are this long that's twice as big as my biggest tarpon fly um, and he likes to fish them and they work but fish you don't always have to fish a great big giant streamer that's really tough to cast and really tough to retrieve um you know there are little sculpins this is a sculpin it's a it's a bait fish that trout really like to eat and they could be tiny you know when they're first hatched they could be really tiny and so you know carry some smaller streamers don't get don't get into this don't buy into this you gotta have big giant articulated streamer deal and crayfish too they eat a lot of crayfish and crayfish are tiny too when they first hatch so don't need big streamers uh, you can you can use them if you want, but they're not. Don't go nuts buying all the and they and they look cool. I mean, they really sell well because they look really cool. The bright colors and they're fuzzy and, and they just look deadly. But um, you know, don't get caught up in having a whole bunch of them. Um, and be method agnostic. You are if if you are just a dry fly angler, you're missing a lot of fun and you're missing a lot of opportunities or if you just fish soft tackles or whatever if you just stick to one method you're going to miss out on a lot of fun you're going to miss out on learning new stuff so you know if you if you always fish during the day fish at night you know go night fishing with a mouse or a big dark big dark streamer um don't go by yourself always go with a partner and don't go to a river that you don't know really really well because it's dangerous uh waiting at night so and stay stay in shallow water but it is it is a whole new way of fishing it's very mysterious it's pretty exciting and um you know it's something new something different so try that if you always fish dry flies hang an nymph on the end of it and fish a nymph <clears throat> use it it's called a dry dropper rig so just put a nymph on it you're fishing two flies at once many days half the fish will take the dry and half the fish will take the nymph and you got a strike indicator on there uh, that's a lot more subtle and more natural than putting a piece of plastic on there that's my preferred way of fishing if i don't know if i don't know a river i don't know what's going on it's first thing i'm gonna go to is dry dropper every time or euro nymphing you've you've all probably heard about euro nymphing how many have tried euro nymphing yeah, I see it's kind of a few like this. Um, it's a real, it's a really different way of fishing. It was developed for competition fishing in Europe, and it's used a lot in the United States now. It's very effective. It's deadly. Um, the casting is a little clunky, and you can't do it in all water types. But if you're in the right water, and you do it right, you're going to catch a pile of trout, a pile of trout more than you've ever caught before <laughs> guaranteed so try it out you might not like it maybe you can borrow a rod from somebody or maybe you can actually euro nymph with your your standard trout rod if you want to try it out um, but but try it out and see how it works do something different and the other thing is don't let anybody tell you that something is not a fly like a mop fly isn't a fly or a worm isn't a fly of course they're flies my rule is if I can put it in my vise and wrap it with thread, then it's a fly. You can have your own rules. You, but don't and, and don't post a picture like this on Instagram because people will will browbeat you uh, till the end of time. You know, they'll tell you that's not a fly. Um, best thing to do is stay off social media with your fish pictures, period. End of story. Um, that's a really good rule. But, you know, I fished this. And I, I wouldn't be afraid. I don't post. I don't post on social media fish pictures. I don't post at all anymore. But I wouldn't be afraid if I did it to post a picture of this this fish on a fly that I tied myself. And there's nothing sluttier than that fly. That's a disgusting <laughs> fly. It's a it's an orange tungsten bead with a couple pieces of crystal chenille on it. That's dirty. It's really awful fly. But I don't care. 
you know, and you shouldn't care either. If you like fish and worm flies and mop flies, then go ahead and do it. Don't let anybody else tell you what a fly is. Dumb. The other thing, another, another interesting thing is to embrace your local bait angler because they always kill fish most of the time, right? And they always know what the fish are eating. Not that they pay that much attention to it because they're just going to go back and fish a worm again, but they know what the fish are eating, right? Because they're cutting them open. We're not, most of us. We're not. We're not. We're catch release. So we're, we don't know what they're eating. And, um, you know, if you don't pump their stomachs, you have no idea what they're eating. So when I moved into my house in Vermont about 20 years ago, 21 years ago, um, this guy drove up to the house and said, hey, the old lady that lived here used to let me park in the driveway and worm fish in the backyard because I live on a little trout stream. Is that okay? I said, yeah, I don't post my land. It's fine. Yeah, you can do it. Um, park in the driveway. One condition. If you catch a big fish. I want to clean it for you. And he said, hmm, yeah, okay, I'm in. I'm into that. So he came up to the house one day after worm fishing with this big brown trout that I had never seen. I had never, ever seen. It was hiding under a log jam for probably his whole life. And I cleaned it for him. And I cut it open, cut open the stomach. And it was full of these land snails, these little tiny kind of tannish land snails that live on grass, you know, blades of grass. You see them? You have them out here, right? I don't even know what they are, what kind, but they, they're kind of a terrestrial snail. And it was full of them. It had hundreds of them in its stomach. So I went, next day, I went upstairs to my fly tying vice. I tied a perfect imitation of one of these land snails. I mean, it was just beautiful. It was absolutely perfect. I fished it all summer. I never caught a fish on it. <laughs> I don't know what that tells you other than... Other than if once you think you've got it all figured out, you don't, you don't, you don't. It's always, it's always a matter of guesswork, always. And, you know, the other thing to do is, is to fish small streams. If you always fish big rivers, if you always float in a raft or drift boat, um, you know, hike a couple miles and fish these small streams. Fish are going to be stupid, easy mostly going to be dry fly fishing they're going to be eager you're not going to see anybody not going to see any rafts for sure you're not going to see any inner tubes and um you're going to have a great day on the water it's kind of getting back to the essence of fly fishing or being a 12 year old kid fishing in small stream i love it i do it a lot uh don't dress your fly and drag um i can't i can't tell you i can't tell you how to avoid drag in here but drag is when the fly line and the leader pull your fly out of position um, before a trout gets to eat it. And, you know, the stuff that they're, they're eating doesn't, doesn't swim across the current. It doesn't, whether it's down below or up above, doesn't often swim across the current unless it's a little bait fish or something like that. Most of these mayflies, stonefly, cast nymphs don't, don't swim very much. They wiggle a little bit, but they don't swim. So you have to you have to avoid drag and drag is situational. So here's a spot where drag is not a problem. It's a, it's a, a slow river. It's the flow is all uniform and you can just kind of there's a fish rising there. You can just kind of throw your fly ahead of it. You don't really have to worry about uh, doing anything fancy at all. The fly will float down. It's not going to drag right away and it's going to be pretty easy. We were we were shooting a, a TV show in Alberta on a Spring Creek once and uh, the cameraman had done a little bit of fly fishing and he was really Jones into fish. So we came to this really easy spot with no drag problems and we gave him the rod and there was a nice rising fish there and he caught the biggest fish of the trip. So we put him back behind the lens for the rest, <laughs> for the rest of the trip, but he was, he was pretty happy and we were too. Um, but you know, normally or often you get all different kinds of, of currents between you and the fish and you have to figure out some way of positioning that fly so that you get you know a drift that's at least this long without it being yanked out of position it's got to float at the same speed as the bubbles this is whether it's a nymph or a dry fly now occasionally the fish will take a dry fly or a nymph that's dragging they, they may but 90% of the time, 95% of the time, you, you want to strive for a dead drift. You're going to get some drag at the end of your drift anyways, regardless of what you do. So you may, that'll give you an idea. Fish are going to take that, that fly that's dragging. Most of the time they won't. 
So um, learn how to avoid drag. And I can't teach you here how to avoid drag because it's situational. Every time I move this much in the stream, the whole drag situation changes. The whole puzzle changes because the currents are different. Um, so you, you really have to spend some time looking at the water and, and planning an attack, playing a little chess game with the water to figure, figure out a couple moves ahead, how you're going to get that fly to drift down to where you think a fish is. Okay. Um, and, and again, I can't, I can't, I can't teach you that here. Sometimes putting two indicators, if you indicate your fish, sometimes putting two indicators on your line will help you get that drag free drift because the, the relationship between the two will, will give you an idea of, of where the fly is and whether you have to mend your line to get, you know, some line upstream of the indicators. So sometimes putting two indicators um, on a leader. I first uh, learned about this in Colorado many years ago using two indicators. Learn how fish change with the seasons because they do move around during the season. They're not, they don't stay in the same place all season long. Well, they might. If, if conditions stay right, they might stay in the same place. But they often move because the water levels change, temperatures change, oxygen levels change. Um, in the wintertime, the fish are going to be deep. They're going to be in deep, slow water. They're not going to be in stagnant water. They'll be in some, some current. They need to have a little bit of current but they're going to be in slow current and they're probably going to be deep. They may even be deeper than that four feet that, that I told you about, you know, two to four feet, they might be six feet deep. So they're going to be deep and not going to be feeding much um, during the winter time, less, less water comes up a couple degrees and then they might feed more actively, but they're still going to be in deep, slow water. Um, if you have to break the ice before you go fishing, you probably should go to have a drink or tie flies. <laughs> And then here's a here's a pool on the batten kill, and and I this is where the fish feed um, in May. And then this is where they feed in August. So why are they there? Sorry, water level. Water level no, shade no, cover no. Aha. Uh -huh. Why? Why? How do you know there's more food coming down there? And how do you know where the current is? The bubbles, the bubbles. Foam is home. You'll, you'll hear people say that a lot. Foam is home. Um, particularly later in the season, um, the trout will be pegged to this foam line. And these fish aren't really in the shade. And yeah, they're in a little bit deeper water. But I guarantee you, if that foam line it probably wouldn't, but if that foam line was going over this shallow water in the middle of the pool, the fish would be pegged to that line as well, because that's where the food is coming from. The bubbles give you an indication of where all the stuff that's good to eat is drifting. So look for that bubble line. Look for that foam line. If the water's really clear on the surface and there's no foam, may not be any fish there. So it'll really give you a key to finding them. And then, um, you know, flies get smaller later in the season. You know, it's unfortunately, it's a fact of life for some reason. Who knows? But the flies get smaller as the season gets later. They get tiny, tiny, tiny. And you have to use small flies. But it's fun. Um, fun fishing small flies. And then flying ants. You see those later in the season? You get flying ants here, right? Um, trout love these things. They love them more than anything. It, it's it's like it's like pistachio nuts to trout. Um they just gobble them. They just gobble them and they can't stop eating them. And these are a terrestrial insect, but when they form these mating swarms, they get attracted to polarized light for whatever reason. They'll land on the they'll land on your car, they'll land on a wet uh, pavement, or they'll land in the river. Um, and trout will go nuts over them. If I'm driving home, when I used to go to the office, when I was driving home, if I my windshield started getting hit with flying ants. I would stop the car, call my wife, tell her I'm not coming home for dinner because, because every fish in the river is going to be up feeding. They're really, it's really a cool opportunity. That's flying ant imitation. There's lots of different ones around. And then in the fall, um, you know, the fall is, gets nicer, gets cooler, um, fewer people on the water. You don't see the you know, inner tubes and, and rafters as much in the fall, but fish actually don't feed as much in the fall. They, their growth slows down. 
They are not grizzly bears. They do not build up fat deposits for the winter. Okay, They're trout, and they feed all the time. They just feed less in the fall, and it's been proven by looking at the growth rates of fish. They just don't feed as much. So it's a great time to be out. You're not going to see fish feeding as actively as you did in May, June, July, August, even September. They are going to, they do slow down. Usually about mid-September, they really slow down in their feeding. But it's a nice time to be out. Um, you know, the leaves are changing and um, it's a beautiful time to be out on the water and you can catch fish. It's just not going to be as hot and heavy as it was earlier in the season. But the brookies and the brown trout are in their spawning colors. They're beautiful. Um, they're moving around. And, uh, you know, the fact that these fish are, are starting to spawn means they start to get aggressive. They start to knock stuff out of their way. Um, they, they just, you know, they, they have to fight when they, when they're spawning, they fight a lot and they just, they just get aggressive. And so streamer fishing in the fall can be really good, not because the fish are so hungry, but because they're trying to swat stuff out of their way. And unfortunately, when that thing they're swatting out of the way has a uh, hook in it, you might, you might catch them. Or you might get a short strike because they're sometimes they'll just body block a streamer. You know, they'll just check it. They'll just push it out of the way, but they'll often eat it. And, uh, you know, floating is one of the best ways to, to do this because you get to cover a lot of water and egg flies work. They're flies, right? Egg flies are flies. Everybody agrees that, right? Egg flies are flies. Okay. Get comfortable with knots. Um, learn, learn a couple of knots really well. I'm not going to tell you which knots to learn. There are lots of good knots to tie on a fly. There are lots of good knots to tie two pieces of tip material together. Um, but learn a couple and learn them at home. Don't try to learn them on the water. There's nothing more frustrating than being on the water and spending 10 minutes tying on a new fly. That's no fun, right? Anybody think it's fun? Okay. I don't think it's fun. Um, so get comfortable with them. Get sit so you can almost tie them with your eyes closed. But learn, learn a couple. Learn one to tie on a fly and learn one to tie two pieces of tip material together. And maybe you throw in a loop knot if you use loop knots for, for stuff. Um, I will tell you what I've learned from guides over the years. Every time I fish with a guide, I ask them, what's your go-to knot for tying on a fly? And what's your go-to knot for tying a tippet on? 90% of them say, tie on a fly, I use a clinch knot. Five or six turn, standard clinch, not improved. Tying two pieces of tip material together, I use a blood knot. Unless my hands are cold or I'm in a hurry, and then I use a triple surgeon's. That's what they that's what they use, and their living depends on them tying good knots. So you can take that for what it's worth. You want to learn the double Davy knot? Go ahead. It's all over the internet. The double Davy knot, the greatest knot ever. Well, not according to guides, but um, and. You know, as far as as far as knot strength between um, one knot or the other, we got this Instron machine at Orvis a number of years ago. We we bought it to test uh, seam strength on waders and and fly line strength and, and tippet strength, so we could evaluate different new products and stuff. And it's very 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 precise, very expensive machine, but super pre precise in measuring and graphing break strengths. So we said, oh boy, now we can finally figure out whether an approved clinch knot is better than a standard clinch knot. This is going to be cool. So we got 10 of us together and we sat in a room and we each tied 10 uh, clinch knots and we tested the tip material. So we know what the tip material itself would break at. We tied them really carefully, slowly, carefully tested them, et cetera. We put them on the instrument and the first person's knot series there was a 30% variation in break strength in one person. And then we went through person two and it was like 25. And then person three, it was 40%. And we said, oh my God, this is crazy. You know, all these dots look good. What's going on here? So we figured, well, maybe let's see what we need to get a, you know, get a 95% confidence limit on, on which knot is better. And we looked at the standard deviation, did all the math. And it told us that we had to tie like three to 400 knots of each type. And we said, nah, <laughs> it's going to remain a mystery. I'm sorry. <laughs> We're not doing it. We're not doing it. Um, but the point here, the really important point here, besides the funny story, is to test your knots. 
every time you tie a knot, whether it's tying on a tippet or tying on a fly, test it. That knot can look perfect, but if you pull it to what you to where you think it's going to break, and it it breaks well before that, then something was wrong with your knot, and the knot can look absolutely beautiful, but you got to test. You got to test every single knot that you tie, or you're going to miss. You might miss the fish of a lifetime because you're not broke. So if you break fish off and your tippet comes back looking like this, everything's okay. You can hang your head high. You just exceeded the break strength of your tippet. You know, it's maybe a, a 10 pound trout on a six X tippet or something just broke. Okay. Yeah. However, however, you know, what's coming next, don't you? Okay. If you're, if your tippet comes back looking like that, do not show this to your friends. <laughs> Because you screwed up and you didn't test your knot. It was a weak knot. It, you didn't tie it right. You didn't take enough turns or whatever. I don't know. I don't know what the variation is caused by. But don't show people pigtails. And then uh, we talk about we talk about uh, cold cold water temperatures a little bit and, and uh, optimum temperatures. This is why we stop fishing to, uh, for trout at sixty eight degrees. So this is how much oxygen water can hold. Uh, graft against temperature and trout need about four parts per million of oxygen. Um, this is what a trout's respiration looks like as temperature increases. So when they're respiring at a higher rate, they're using a lot more oxygen, right? Cause they're, it's like you just ran a marathon. And, um, so at a certain point, the trout could literally suffocate. And when we, when we fish for them, it's like running a marathon and then getting chased by a grizzly bear, right? They're already running a marathon and then they're getting chased by a grizzly bear. They're probably going to die. Um, and so we just stop fishing at 68 degrees, period. End of story. Um, and, you know, you won't um, some some states will uh, close certain rivers uh, when the water temps get too high, but not all of them. They don't monitor all of them. So carry thermometer and water hits 68. Stop fishing, period. If you're fishing for brook trout, you may want to stop at 65. Trout can survive up to 80 degrees um, in, in some situations if they have enough oxygen, um, but not when you not when you jerk them around on the end of the line and stress them. So that's why we stop fishing at 68 degrees. And by the way, just because you release all your fish does not make you a conservationist. I'm going to proselytize a little bit here. Okay. You, all you're doing is being selfish. All you're doing is stockpiling trout for somebody else or for you to catch next week. You're not, you're not helping the resource at all by releasing fish. A trout stream can be repopulated by very few spawning pairs of trout that have happened to survive. Um, within three or four years, the, the population could be back to normal if you almost fish out a stream or kill all the fish. It doesn't take long if the habitat's there. If the water quality is there and the habitat's there. So what you all need to do, if you if you want to enjoy this resource, it's it's all, all, all of our responsibility to give back and to make sure that we protect the habitat. Join Trout Unlimited, um, Western Rivers Conservancy, or whatever, whatever other organization pays attention and magnifies political power to um, protect this resource. So just being catch and release, sorry, not a conservationist. You know, uh, taking a water temperature. And finally, uh, take good pictures. Do your friends on Instagram a favor. Don't show them another grip and grin. We're all sick of seeing your grip, grip and grin pictures. I'm sorry. We don't want to see your face in the pictures. In order to get your face in the picture, you got to handle a fish longer. They're dumb pictures anyways, but you got to handle a fish longer. You got to hold it up in front of your face. Sometimes they fall on the bottom of the boat and they get banged around, but you have to handle them more. Handling time is one of the, is one of the most critical things uh, for uh, trout survival. The longer you handle them, the less chance they have of survival. So get rid of the grip and grins. That's an ugly picture. He's proud of that fish, but do we really need his face in the picture? Nah, nah, we don't need his face. You know you caught that fish. Why do you need your face in the picture? You know you caught it. How about that? How about that? Isn't that nicer? The fish's head is in the water, so it, we're keeping the gills wet. Um, it looks better there. Isn't that a nicer picture? Or better yet, you know, if, if you have an underwater camera or underwater housing for your iPhone or whatever, take pictures underwater or videos underwater because their colors show up a lot better. 
and they look a lot better underwater. They're in their environment. So, um, you know, take, take better pictures if you're going to share them with people or just for your own. You know, you know you caught that fish. You don't need grip and grins. Okay, that is it. And nobody fell asleep. I'm proud of you all. Very proud of you. Well, I didn't see you around the corner. I fell asleep there. Anyway, um, I really want to thank you uh, for coming tonight. Um, if you want to ask some questions now, feel free. Um, ask any question you want. Yes. Yeah, it can. It can. And, you know, if, if I've got a really uh, fussy fish rising, um, you know, a lot of people will put two dries on. They'll put a big dry so they can see it. And then they'll put a little dry because they think the fish is taking a little dry. But that does increase not only the kind of the clunkiness of your casting, but it, do, it can increase the drag on the fly. So, yeah, it can. Yeah. Good question. Yes. What kind of photo equipment do I use? Yeah. Well, you know, I find myself using a, a iPhone more and more, but I use I use some uh, high end Sony cameras for a lot of the stuff that you see here. Most of none of I don't think any of these are cell phone pictures. Yeah. So I care. I lug a big camera around if I'm taking pictures for this kind of stuff. Yeah. Any other questions? Yes. <laughs> yeah, I try not to. Said that in your podcast. Yeah. Okay. What is your attitude when you're getting stuff? You just go, "Hey, it's fishing," or it's like my attitude is, "I'm doing, I'm lame." Yeah. What, what's your, what is your attitude when you're? What is my attitude when I get skunked? Yeah. He says he's la He feels lame. Yeah, I do too. <laughs> I do too. You can ask my wife when I when I come home and I got skunked. I, I'm. She doesn't want to be around me. <laughs> I. You know. I think God. You know, I shouldn't be doing this podcast. I shouldn't be doing what I'm doing. I can't even catch a fish. Yeah. I mean, I get frustrated. Not every, not every day. Sometimes I'll go home and say, yeah, it wasn't that good today. But I often, yeah, I often get frustrated. Yeah, absolutely. Any other? Yeah. Yeah, so I'm a rookie fly fisherman. And it seems like whenever I hook a fish, it gets off. Yep. Even if I'm cleaning the line tight, it seems like I always pull a fly out. Like, yep. Why do I do that? Well, you're probably fishing small flies, right? Yeah. Yeah, you're fishing midges. Um, midges don't, you know, little hooks don't hold that well. And particularly if a fish gets downstream of you, um, the, it's a good chance the hook's going to pull out. And particularly with rainbow trout, there's not a there's not a good way of getting around it. You just, you know, you're going to drop a bunch of fish. And some days it seems like you drop more than others, right? Um, you can try, if you can, to get downstream quickly of the fish so that it, ha it has to fight upstream of you. Um, that's going to, it's going to, you're going to be pulling against, you know, against the fish as opposed to pulling it out of its mouth. So you can, if you can try to either manipulate the rod or get the fish to go upstream of you. That's, a, that's about the only thing I can tell you. Yeah. Pardon me. I'd count it as a caught fish. Yeah. You fooled him. You, you fooled him. That's the important thing. Yeah. You didn't get that Instagram picture, but you fooled him. So. Other questions? No, no other questions. Oh, yeah. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I don't have any, um, I, I honestly don't have any rote methods that I use for stuff like that. I will tell you that one of the best ways to fish something that drops off that quickly is to use a, a Euro nymphing technique. And, you know, you're holding your rod up here. And as soon as your flies go over that drop off, then lower your rod and you can kind of dip them down into that drop. Yeah, that, that'll work. That'll work. And it's pretty efficient. Yes. Pardon? Yeah. Yeah. Most of the time, unless I forget, 
I don't tie on bar. I don't always tie on barbless hooks, but I usually pinch it before I fish. Yeah. I don't fish barbless hooks for tarpon though. <laughs> they shake the hook too easily. Yes. Oh, yeah. Good, good point. Yeah. Um, tippet rings, you know, for tying your tippet on is a really good way to do it, particularly if you're going. I go a lot from nylon. When I'm nipping, I have a nylon leader and then I tie fluorocarbon to it. And knots are tricky between nylon and fluorocarbon. They'll hold if you tie them right, but they're a little trickier. And so using a tippet ring is great because you really only need one knot, right? Clinch knot to both ends of the tippet ring. So, yeah, they're great. They're great. And I, I do use them. Even with dry flies, you know, the, the little tiniest size, I'll sometimes use a tippet ring. Yeah. Yeah. Good, good question. Yes. I'm really, I'm really lazy and I just tie it to the bend. Even with a barbless hook, um, I don't find it slips off that much. Um, but I will tie eye to eye too sometimes, you know, depends. But yeah, usually I'm just tying to the bend. Seems to work. Yes. How much of a difference do you think I think fluorocarbon tip makes a lot of difference when you're fishing down below the surface of the water. I use nylon for my drives. I use fluorocarbon for anything that sinks. Streamers, nymphs, salt water, carp. I use nylon. I use fluorocarbon. Yep. Not because it's less visible or anything. Because I don't I, I think trout can still see it, even if it's 7X fluorocarbon. I think they can see it. Because they can see size 54 midges, you know, they can see that, they can see, they can see that tippet, um, but it, it just sinks better. And it's a little, I think it's a little more abrasion resistant too. So yeah, anything sunken fluorocarbon. Yes. Uh, how do I decide? It depends on, it, it depends on lots of things. And depends on uh, how wide the river is. You know, if it's a big, wide river, I'm probably not going to try to fight the current and fish upstream. I'm probably going to try to fish down. But in a small stream, you know, you can't really sneak around that much if you're a, if you're upstream of the fish. So I always fish upstream in a small stream. In a medium-sized stream, I kind of look at the situation. You know, I kind of look at the kind of water that I expect to fish and say, well, you know, is this do I approach this better upstream or downstream? Yeah, I mean, it's situational. It varies. It varies with every little piece of water. Yes? Uh, how do you decide, like, what kind of your indicator? Well, I, you know, I have how to put the indicator. I start with one and a half times the water depth. That's kind of the rule of thumb because your, your flies seldom hang straight down. They hang at an angle. But I start with a you know, about one and a half times. And if I'm not bumping bottom, I might add a longer tippet. Yeah, you go from the bottom fly. Yeah, you go from the bottom fly. Because mm -hmm. sometimes the fish are feeding midwater, you know. You don't always have to go as deep as one and a half times the water depth. Sometimes you can get away with a much shorter dropper. Yep. Yes. <laughs> I don't give favorite. I don't have a favorite trout rod, favorite trout fly, favorite trout river, or favorite place to fish. I don't. I don't have one. Yeah, one I haven't been to. The favorite trout rod is the one that's in the back of my truck. Yeah. Sorry to be squirrely about that, YouTube, but that's. That's the truth. <laughs> Anything else? Yes. So when you do fish like multiple flies on a rig, um, I, I'd say mostly three just because of regulations. Mm -hmm. places. Yep. What makes you like, where do you just, how do you decide how much space to put between those three flies? And then, like, do you also think it would be beneficial? Maybe put three midges very close together and form sort of like a cluster, um, or maybe not even midges, but something different. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I generally, I don't know, I generally put my nymphs about this far apart. 
unless I start to follow hook fish, if I follow hook fish, then I'll make it longer just because, you know, if you, with a long, with a long distance between the two flies, you're less likely to follow hook a fish. Um, but I don't know. I don't, I'm not very scientific about how much distance I put between my flies. There's probably other people that are a lot more scientific than me, but I'm not just, you know, start with about that and <laughs> go from there. I think that I think that's an interesting concept. I, I never thought of that, but you know, kind of a cluster of, of midges together. I think you're going to end up foul hooking a lot of fish with the with the flies that close together. Um, but yeah, it's I think it's worth a try. Yeah, play around with it, see if it works. I've never done it, but it might work. I might have discovered something new. <laughs> Anything else? Yes. It's worth the price if you can afford it. Your your more expensive rod is probably going to be made in USA if that's important to you instead of made overseas. Uh, it's going to be more accurate. It's going to be a more accurate rod. It's going to put it. You're going to have an easier time putting the fly where you want to put it. It's going to look prettier. That's important to some people. And it's also probably be less likely to break. Um, we had we had a situation. I'll give you an example. The Helios 3. Um, we worked a lot. We worked a lot with um, increasing the wall strength on those rods as well as still keeping them light and flexible. But we we really increased the, the hoop strength. Um, and the other day we were we were driving. Um, from one place to the other. And I had a rod and I stupidly didn't put it, you know, I didn't put it away. I just broke it in half and threw it in the back of the, the truck. And it was just laying on the floor of the truck. And we had uh, this little white table in the truck. And the table, when we made a turn, slammed down on both pieces of that Helios 3 rod. Just flat just flat out slammed out on top of it so we stopped we looked at it it looked all right we you know we lifted up the table and it, it really it had fallen right on top of the rod so we lifted up the table and i put it together and i said well you know it looks all right it looks pretty good and we went fit i went fishing with it um, it was a five weight i landed a 15 pound carp with it the next day i fished all day on the Colorado, caught a bunch of fish on streamers and it still didn't break. So it's probably okay. I figured, you know, it's, it's probably good. Um, but I, I was really, I was surprised myself that it, that it didn't break. So that's, that's another difference. Um, expensive rods going to give it's going to be more durable. It's going to have nicer guides, going to have nicer real seat. And it's going to be more accurate. Yes. For kids, don't hinder them with a super short rod. You know, fly rods today only weigh a couple of ounces. Don't get a kid rod. Um, just, you know, get a like a seven and a half, eight foot rod, an adult rod. Um, they can cast it. They can handle it. Um, super short rods are really hard to cast. So it's going to be harder for them to learn. And they're not very good fishing tools. Really? So, you know, these little novelty kids rods aren't very good. So just get them, you know, like an encounter or clear water, uh, lower end, um, um, just basic, you know, four weight, seven and a half for four weight, something like that. But don't, don't hamstring them with a, with a little short rod. Yeah. You're welcome. I see that mistake all the time. People want to get the, these little tiny rods for their kids, you know, and they just, they don't, they don't need it. They can fish. You can fish an adult rod. Any other questions? A uh, YouTube question? Okay. How worried are you about environmental issues such as climate change and drought? And it's definitely affected uh, the person in the past that uh, they're fishing in the lake. Uh, they keep me up at night. That's how worried I am. <laughs> I'm very worried. And I'm going to do everything I can to, you know, try to help it. But you can't can't do much about drought. You have to try to 
you know, live with the situation and, and mitigate it however you can. Yes. To a mountain stream, probably seven and a half or three or four. But, you know, you can do it with an eight. You can do it with a nine, too. You can do it with a longer rod. But, I, you know, I kind of like the smaller rod. Not super short. Not like six and a half or anything that short. Because it's hard to hold line off the water. So seven and a half, eight foot, three or four weight. Yep. Anything else? Yes. Hmm, if you're upgrading, probably the rod. Probably the rod. I mean, reels are, for the for trout fishing, for the most part, we don't use the drag that often. But reels are pretty, and, you know, we like to have nice-looking reels. You can get a pretty decent-looking decent, decent looking reel for not a lot of money. Um, you know, rod or a, a good fly line. If you don't have a high-end fly line, uh, that'll, that'll make a big difference just because it'll float better, it'll cast better. Anything else? Yes. Uh, these days, to get a good quality fly line, you're going to have to pay about 100 bucks. Yep. You can get a decent fly line for a lot cheaper, and it'll be fine. It'll work. It'll be fine. But if you want to get, you know, a line that's really going to perform, going to shoot well, cast well, and last a lot longer, and not need to be cleaned as often, going to pay hundred bucks. What's the price of? 100? Yeah, between ninety nine and one twenty. So they're not cheap, but it's going to last you. You know, if you take care of it, you don't get insect repellent on it. Um, it's going to last you four or five years. You don't need to change your line every year. Yes. I don't remember my first fish on a fly rod because um, I fished a lot for like sunfish and things in neighborhood ponds. It might have been a little tiny largemouth bass, you know, in a, in a neighborhood pond, a little, little tiny one. I think that was probably my first fish on a fly rod. Yeah. Yes. Do you use swivels? I do sometimes use swivels. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, usually for streamers. Yeah. Swivels are great. These little micro swivels are, are really great. The same purpose as a tippet ring, really. But if you have something that tends to twist the lead or the line a lot, a swivel will help. Yeah. All right. Well, I want to thank everyone for coming. You've had these have been some great questions. You've been a great audience. I I can tell you're I can tell you're really engaged. So appreciate y'all coming. Don't forget. There's still a discount, right? Yes. Okay, you want to come up here and say something? He's pushing me up here. All right. <laughs> Dad's pushing me up here. Thank you, everyone. Thank you guys for coming tonight. Let's give Tom one more round of applause. Thank you, Tom. Awesome. All right, just a quick check of hands. Is this anyone's first time to Angler's Covey tonight? Welcome. Only a couple. Okay, awesome. I saw one. I saw two. You saw two. Okay, two people. Awesome. Well, those of you who have been here before, you kind of know our program, but this register is still open. We're doing 10% off of all Orvis product tonight, just as an FYI. And we're just so thankful that you guys came out here. Um, stay tuned for Small Business Saturday that's coming up right after Thanksgiving. That's our next big event. We're going to have some more speakers, not quite as cool as Tom, but so, I mean, yeah, almost there, almost there. Awesome. And yeah, anything you want to say? Tie nights every Wednesday night. Any fly tires here? So if you do, we have a tie night here. It's just a super informal. We meet around the tying center. Um, we bring beer, whiskey, pizza, just hang out. So it's not a tying class, but if you already tie, bring your vice, bring your tools and just come 
hang and you can learn a lot from other tires. That's how I improved a lot of my tying is just by making friends at tie night. So every Wednesday night we have tie night. And yeah, if you're still getting into fly fishing, we do Orvis 101s every other Saturday in the wintertime. And then, and that's just a fly fishing intro class, but we're also doing a fly tying 101s every other Saturday right now too. And our 101 tying class is also free. So if you've never tied your own flies and that's something that sounds interesting to you, um, sign up online. And again, every other Saturday it's free and you'll tie your first fly. And we have fly tying 201 that goes right after the 101. So if you want to spend your whole morning here and learn how to tie, I think we, depending on how many people are in class, about five flies, you'll be ending up tying all different. Um, so if you're interested in that, come there. And everything is on our website, on our calendar. So you don't have to memorize it all right now. All right, let's give Tom one last round of applause and have a great night. I mean, there used to be really, you couldn't tell there was anybody living there except the curtains would move when you walked through the top. Oh my God. Yeah. 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 Western New York guy, right? Yeah. So do you remember Carl Coleman? Coleman was my mentor. I thought so. Yeah, Coleman was, he taught me a hell of a lot about flight. Yeah, you know, I've, uh, I've talked to Carl recently. He, uh, he uh, has pictures of you and uh, him together. Oh, yeah. I got the, I got those on my phone still. Yeah, yeah. he's a great guy. What a brilliant guy. Yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah.